Worship the Lord and sing God's praises. Make a joyful noise for the rock of our salvation. Drink of Christ, living water. We thirst for God's love. Our opening hymn is number 361 in the hymnal, The Rock of Ages Cleft for Me. Uh, Justin is on a well deserved vacation. And so I'm leaving this. Please stand and we we'll sing all four verses, Rock of Ages. <laughs> Thank you. 
381 in your hymnal and is on the screen in front of you. Please join me in this historic declaration of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the community of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Our lesson from the Hebrew Scriptures this morning is Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Water from the rock. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stun me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the mine and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Messiah and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not?
seated. Uh, but the gospel reading this morning is John chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. Jesus and the woman of Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will proclaim all these things to us. Jesus said to her, I am He, the one who is speaking to you. Just then His disciples came. They were astonished that He was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back into the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and went on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then come to the harvest? But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the word of God, read for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for letting us worship your name, sing your praises, and hear your word proclaimed. Father, thank you for all of our blessings. Please accept these tithes, offerings, and alms as we give them back to you for service in your kingdom. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
to her deployment. An IED had detonated under her vehicle, and she returned to the States with one less leg than she went with. And that's why people stared at her. They stared as if she was an entirely different entity. She wasn't quite human. Because after all, didn't everybody that was normal have two legs? After a while, she got tired. She got frustrated with the stares that people continued to give her. The parents who quickly ushered their children away with the apologies when they kind of looked in embarrassment when the kids asked too many questions about her leg. Or just the looks of pity. She hated those the most. She felt like an outcast, a, a misfit in society that didn't have a place for people like her. This must have been how the nameless Samaritan woman at the well felt. Samaritans were a race of people that the Jews utterly despised as to having no claim on their God. And even worse, she was an outcast and looked down by, upon her own people. This is evident in the fact that she came alone to draw water uh, when the community wasn't there at midday. See, in biblical times, drawing water from the well and chatting with the others at the well was a social high point for the women. However, this woman came at midday, obviously trying to avoid the others. The story opens with Jesus heading back to Galilee from Jerusalem. He chooses to go through Samaria. Uh, literally speaking, he didn't have to go through Samaria. In fact, given the hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans, it would have likely been that he would have avoided it. But instead, he chooses to take this route that day. And the scene takes place in Jacob's well. Now, Jacob is a common ancestor for the woman and for Jesus. Since Samaritans only believed in the Pentateuch, that is the first five uh, books of the Bible, the Old Testament, um, their spiritual heroes were the patriarchs like Abraham and Jacob, right? And even Moses. Uh, so Jacob's well would clearly have been a common ancestor for them both. Now, why does she come in the middle of the day? The, uh, the, the logical explanation is to just avoid contact with others, right? who were regularly at the well. Now Jesus too is alone at the well without his disciples. They were hungry and they went to, to town to get food, leaving Jesus high and dry, and especially in the throat at that moment, right? So Jesus, he asked this woman, will you give me uh, some water to drink? The woman is, is shocked, really. Perhaps she had hoped to, to get her water quietly and to make her way back home without having to talk with anyone, especially some stranger from out of town. See, there were strict protocols in these cultures regarding uh, when and who men and women were to talk to, could speak with. And the last thing that this woman expected was to be asked something personal, uh, like get a drink of water, which would require direct and indirect physical contact. She says, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink of water? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you to give me a drink, you would have asked him and we would have given you living water. One of the keys to understanding this dialogue is the fact that the phrase living water had very specific, almost literal meaning in the day. It meant a creek or a, a river uh, water. In other words, it meant water that was moving, right? It seemed to be alive. So when Jesus tells the woman that he has living water to offer her, she takes him literally. She's thinking... Why, why did I come to this well? Wait a minute. Did you mean there's a creek closer to town that I could have gone to and I could have avoided all this? Right? Where's this water you're referring to, Jesus? Notice that Jesus suggests the woman needs to know 
the gift of God and who it is that asks for a drink. In a dry, in a weary land, water meant life. The woman can be forgiven for assuming that Jesus must have been out in the sun a little too long, right? And, and so she tells him, uh, you, you, you've got no water, nor do you even have a bucket to draw from the well. So where in the world are you getting this moving and living water you're referring to? So still confused, she says, are you greater than Father Jacob who gave us the well, and he, he, he drank from it himself, and he also brought his sons and his livestock too. Jesus' response is that the water that he gives is categorically different. It is the ultimate thirst quencher. One will never be thirsty again. We must remember that the water literally means life, right? It means that then, and it means that us today. And here, uh, the water uh, means metaphorically everlasting life. But sadly, like Nicodemus, the woman still does not get it. She doesn't understand that Jesus is speaking to her on a non-literal level. And then the dialogue takes this sudden turn, right? When Jesus, out of the blue, he tells the woman to go back to town, call her husband, and come back again. And her reply is honest, but it does not tell the whole story, right? Jesus, who knows what's in one's heart, says you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. One can only imagine that her eyes get huge and she blurts out, he must be a prophet, right? He knows all this about her. She immediately, now, now when we get to an uncomfortable subject, what do we do? We immediately change the subject, don't we? And that's what's going to happen here. She, 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 she goes into this dialogue about this theological war that's been going on between the Jews and the Samaritans forever, right? The Samaritans believed in one God, but precisely because they had the Pentateuch as their scripture. Uh, they believed in one holy mountain, too, not Mount Zion. Mount Gerizim. Now, um, they thought that Mount Gerizim was the site that uh, Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac. And that's one of the reasons. Um, the other is they believed that the first temple was built there. Um, and they claimed that Moses told them to protect Mount Gerizim and to worship on it. Now, just interestingly enough, today there still are about 800 Samaritans. They're very low in number. Um, they all live somewhere near Mount Gerizim at the base of or in that surrounding area. And they are, to my knowledge, the only practicing group that celebrates Passover and still slaughters at least a lamb. Now, see, the, as we get back to the story, we, we, we see this battle of this sacred place of worship. It's, it's kind of an ongoing fight, right? But here we see that Jesus is pointing her away from the place explaining, yes, salvation does come from the Jews. I, I'm the one. I'm standing here in front of you right here. He's the Messiah standing right there in front of her. And Jesus says, but true worship is not about finding a proper, sacred place, but rather a way of worship in spirit and in truth. True worship evokes a lively presence of God himself. It invokes the conveyance of truth. It is a place where our head and our heart both engage in praise and adoration for our Savior and our Maker. Again, the, 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 the scene shifts, right? And the disciples return, taking out their lunches. They can hardly believe their eyes, and they wonder why Jesus is talking to a Samaritan a woman and an outcast in society. Who are outcasts in society today? See, an outcast in society is defined as someone who is physically, 
emotionally, relationally, or mentally expelled from the involvement in population. This expression most often refers to people considered uh, abnormal or possessing uh, undesirable qualities, criminals, people with disabilities, minorities, people with addiction issues, the poor. These are just a few examples uh, of people that are sometimes treated as outcast in our world today. Sometimes we even put labels on people before we even know them. Sometimes crazy things. We live in Alabama where there is a huge rivalry between Alabama and Auburn football, isn't there? And believe it or not, sometimes we, we kind of have an image of somebody. You know those Auburn fans, or you know those Alabama fans, right? Why? Just, just because. The list of labels um, we use to minimize people seems to be never ending, really. Right? Think about it. We all do it to some degree. Conservative Republicans, that is liberal Democrats, the poor and the lazy, the rich and the snobby, the young and the disrespectful, or the old and the out of touch. See, we stereotype as a way of, of simplifying people into these easy, manageable boxes, don't we? Boxes that we can disregard based on our own bias and opinions. But socially constructive barriers hurt both ways, really. They rob others of their identity and they rob us of the opportunity to connect with others. The other night, I, I had an all day thing going on with Walgreens. I couldn't get through and so I finally got straight down and I was going to get in line and get my prescription, right? So I drive around to the drive through and it shut down. Oh, goodness gracious. So, so I go inside and where I find seven people in front of me in line. By the time I made it to the front of the line, there were six more behind me. It was late and I was tired. But as I got in my car to return home, I realized I had not spoken to one person in line. I barely connected with the clerk. Was I sizing up the people in line and concluding maybe I had nothing in common with them? I hope that wasn't the case. Nevertheless, I spent my time aimlessly checking my email instead of connecting with others. As I was driving home, I began to uh, think of this week's gospel story and where Jesus reached out to others of all kinds throughout the gospels even and especially the outcast in society. I really felt ashamed of myself and I, I, I started thinking, was it my tiredness? Was, was it my carelessness? Or was it even my complacency? I, I wasn't willing to step out of my comfort zone and connect with those people that were right in front of me. See, throughout the Bible, Jesus connects with others, making each person feel loved. He, he, he tends to choose even the social outcast to be his missional agents, from backwater fishermen to tax collectors, from prostitutes to those that have been blind, paralytics. Jesus disrupts expectations when picking his lineup for his team, doesn't he? He does it again in this story today. Choosing a vulnerable, socially marginalized woman to be an agent of change for people. Our first evangelist, right? See, our God is a God of the unexpected. And our Creator often chooses those we least expect to initiate the biggest changes the woman's reality is transformed by her interaction with Jesus. At the beginning of this story, she comes to the well thirsty with a drinking jar in hand. But at the end, Jesus tells her that he is the fount of living water. He's the only true thirst quencher. 
and the only one that can provide a wellspring gushing up to eternal life. When this woman returns to town, she goes without a jar, without a jug. She goes with a wellspring of life gushing up inside of her. And when the wellspring overflows, bringing new life into the entire community. The story of the woman at the well teaches us that God loves us. In spite of our bankrupt lives, God values us enough to actively seek us, to welcome us into intimacy, and to rejoice in our worship. As a result of Jesus' conversation, only a person like, like the Samaritan woman, an outcast from her own people, could understand what this means to be wanted, to be cared for, when no one, not even herself, could see anything of value in her. And this is grace indeed. But like the disciples in the story, we often scratch our heads and we wonder what God is doing, even as it's happening before our very eyes. We often put labels on people before we even know them. As Christians, we're called to follow in Jesus' footsteps, to be bridge builders in a world of disconnect. But just as often we find ourselves in the position of the <coughs> well, a position of vulnerability. Many of us have been hurt by rejection and the condemnation of others. We know what it's like to be an outcast. This is the story of reassurance that Jesus sees us. There's not a line that he won't cross to envelop us in his love. He has a place for all of us in his kingdom, and he longs to bring all of his children home. Those who've lost the most often truly know the love of our Savior, and they know what it's like to invite others who are lost into a place of safety and acceptance. Despite all the labels that could have been heaped on this Samaritan woman, Jesus disregards them and he chooses to bring her in to the community. And more than that, he makes her an agent of change by which the whole community is eventually saved. The simple act of setting stereotypes aside or turning toward others is enough to transform our whole world. With God's grace, we can make others around us feel valuable, feel worthy, feel loved. So when you're standing in line, don't do what I did. Next time, let's be alert to those. Let's realize it. Everybody's made in God's image. Let's realize that all of us have felt unwanted at some point in our life. And let's share the love of the one and only thirst question. Let us pray. Precious God, be with us as we go into the world this week. Remind us to be agents of your law. Help us to open ourselves up to others, to connect with others, and to share the good news that we've heard. Help us especially be alert to those that are in pain, who feel vulnerable in our world, Lord. Guide us, direct us, and nudge us this week as we come into contact with strangers. We ask it in your holy name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 380. There's within my heart a melody. Please stand and we'll sing all five verses. Jesus. 
our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.